Hi, everybody. So we are at chapter 52 of Children of Blood and Bone and Amari's Perspective. In and wait, I pushed through the diviners, filling the grassy walkway between two long rows of tents. Their curious gazes add a weight to my step, but they're not enough to distract me from the question filling my head. When Dezayn left, Zeli ran after him, trying in vain to make him understand, but then my brother ran after her, leaving me all alone in that tent. Enan stops when he hears my voice, though he doesn't turn around. His eyes follow Zeli, trailing her as she disappears into the crowd. When he turns to me, I don't know which question I should ask first. It's as if I'm back inside the palace walls, so close to him, yet always worlds apart. You should have Zoo heal that. He grabs my wrists, inspecting the dark red bruises and dried blood where the ropes cut through my skin. Distracting myself from the pain was easy when I was carrying to Zane, but now the throbbing is constant, burning wherever the cool wind hits my exposed flesh. When she's rested, I pull my hands back, crossing my arms to hide them. She's too drained after healing to Zane, and she still needs to take care of Jalen. I don't want her to get hurt. She reminds me of you. Enid smiles, but it doesn't reach his eyes. You used to get that crazed look on your face when you had an idea and you knew you'd get your way. I know the look he speaks of. He had one of his own. He'd get a smile so wide, his nose would scrunch up and his eyes would nearly crinkle closed. It's that look that got me out of bed at night to sneak into the royal stables or dive headfirst into a barrel of sugar in the kitchen. Back when things were simpler, before Father and Orisha wedged themselves between us. I've been meaning to give you this. Enan reaches inside his pocket. I expect a death threat from Father. I can hardly breathe when I see the glint of my old headdress. How? My voice cracks when he places it in my hand. Though dented, rusted, and stained with blood, holding it warms my chest. It's like getting a little piece of benta back. I've been carrying it since Sokoto, thought you would want it back. I clutch the headdress to my chest and stare at him, a wave of gratitude rushing through me. But the gratitude only makes our reality worse. Are you really a magi? The question fights its way out as I study the white streak in Eden's hair. Headdress or not, I still don't understand. What are his powers? Why him and not me? If the gods ordained who receives their gifts, what made them choose Enan? Enan nods, running his hands through the streak. I don't know how or why. It happened when I touched the scroll in Lagos. Does father know? Am I still breathing? Enan attempts to keep his voice light, but the pain breaks through. The image of the sword that cut Benta forces itself into my mind. It's far too easy to imagine Father plunging that sword into Enan's chest as well. How could you? Every other question vanishes, as the only one that matters finally comes out. I feel every time I defended him to Zeli balloon inside me. I thought I knew my brother's true heart. Now I'm not sure I know him at all. I can understand being under Father's influence, but he's not here, I press. How am I ever supposed to trust you when you've been fighting against yourself this entire time? Enan's shoulders slump. He scratches the back of his neck. You can't, he replies, but I'll earn your trust, I promise. In another life, those words would be enough, but Benta's death still scars my memories. I can't help but think of all the signs, every chance I had to release her from palace life. If only I'd been more vigilant, then my friend would still be alive. These people, I clutch her headdress, they mean the world to me. I love you, Enan, but I won't allow you to hurt the Magi the way you've hurt me. I know, Enan nods, but I swear on the throne, that's not my aim. Zelly's taught me how wrong I was about the Magi. I know I've made mistakes. His voice softens when he speaks Zelly's name, as if recalling a fond memory. More questions bubble inside me as he turns to search for her in the crowd, but for now I push them back down. I can't begin to fathom what she did to change my brother's mind, but the only thing that matters now is that this change is here for good. For your sake, I hope you don't make any more. Enan eyes me, face difficult to read as he looks me up and down. It's not a threat. It's a promise. 
If I suspect any treachery, it'll be my sword you'll have to face. It wouldn't be the first time our swords clashed, and it certainly won't be likely the last. I'll prove myself to you, to all of you, Enan declares. You're on the right side of this. My only desire is to stand there as well. Good. I lean forward to hug him, holding on to his promise. But when his hands wrap around my back, all I can think of are how his fingers are resting just above my scars. Okay, so we just ch finished chapter 52. So take a minute, summarize the chapter. What, what character development has Amari just gone through? How has she grown as a character in this chapter? In chapter 53, we are in Zelly's perspective. The next morning, Zoo is quick to bound into my tent. There's so much I have to show you, she shakes my arm. Zelly, come on, it's almost midday. With enough prodding, I concede and sit up, working through the new coils in my hair to scratch my scalp. Be quick, Zoo shoves a sleeveless red dashiki into my arms. Everyone's waiting outside. When she leaves, I offer to Zane a smile, but he keeps his back to me. Even though I can tell he's awake, he doesn't make a sound. The uncomfortable silence that burned between us last night returns. The frustrated sighs and empty words filling our tent. No matter how many times I apologized, Tizane wouldn't respond. Do you want to come? I ask quietly. A walk could be good for your leg. Nothing. It's like speaking to the air. Tizane, I'm staying. He shifts and stretches his neck. I don't feel like walking with everyone. I remember Zoo's words. I assumed she meant Kwame and Falake, but Enan's probably right outside. If Tizane's still this upset, seeing Enan will only make everything worse. Okay. I slip into the dashiki and tie my hair back with a blue and red patterned scarf Zoo lent me. I'll be back soon. I'll try to bring you some food. Thanks. I latch on to the response, repeating it in my head. If Tizane can manage a grumble of gratitude now... Maybe things will turn out all right. Zell, he looks over his shoulder, meeting my eye. Be careful. I don't want you alone with him. I nod and leave the tent, the weight of Tizane's warning dragging me down. But as soon as I step into the camp, all the heaviness evaporates. Sunlight fills the spacious valley. Every acre of the lush greens explode with life. Young diviners bustle through the maze of pop-up shacks, tents, and carts. Each person shines with white hair and vibrant patterns woven through their dashikis and spirited caftans. It's like Sky Mother's promise laid before my eyes. Come to life after all this time. Gods! I spin, taking it all in as Zoo waves me over. I've never seen so many diviners in one spot, especially with so much joy. The crowd laughs and smiles through the hills, white hair braided, dreaded, and flowing. An unfamiliar freedom breathes in their shoulders, in their gait, in their eyes. Look out! I throw my hands up, smiling as a group of young children run past. The oldest among the crowd looked to be in their 20s, none older than 25. Of all the diviners before us, they're the most bewildering to see. Never in my life have I encountered so many grown diviners outside the prison cells or the stocks. Finally! Zoo hooks her arm in mine, sporting a smile almost too big for her face. She pulls me past the yellow-painted cart where Enan and Amari are waiting. Amari grins when she sees me, but her face falls when she doesn't find Tizane. He wanted to rest. I answer her unasked question. And he didn't want to see your brother. Enan looks at me, handsome in cobalt caftan with fitted, patterned pants. He looks different without the harsh lines and jagged metal of his uniform. Softer, warmer. His streak flashes bright in his hair, for once not hidden behind a helmet or black dye. Our eyes linger on each other, but it takes only a second for Zoo to whip between us and pull us both along. We've made progress, but we still have a ways to go if we're going to be ready for tonight. She seems to speak a million meters a second, always discovering something new she has to say before finishing her last thought. This is where the old stories are going to be. Zoo points to a makeshift stage occupying a grassy knoll between two tents. Sorry about that. Oh, I lost my spot. There we go. There's a diviner from Jametta who's telling them. You have to meet her. She's enchanting. We think she'll be a titer. 
Oh, and this, this is where we'll have the divin diviners touch the scroll. I can't wait to watch that. It'll be incredible. Zoo moves through the crowd with the magnetism of a queen. Diviners stop and stare as she passes, pointing and whispering about us because she's holding my hand. Usually I hate when others stare, but today I find myself reveling in it. It's not like the guards are Kasaidan who want me to disappear. The diviners' gazes hold a reverence, a new kind of respect. Here's the best part. Zoo gestures to a large clearing being decorated with painted lanterns and colorful sheets. This is where the opening procession will take place. Zelly, you must be in it. Oh, you don't want that. I shake my head fervently, but I laugh when Zoo grabs my wrist and jumps up and down. Her joy is contagious. Even Enan can't help but smile. You would be so great. Her eyes go wide. We don't have a reaper yet, and Oya's attire would fit you perfectly. It has this long red skirt and golden top. Enan, don't you think she would look incredible? Enan's eyes widen and he stammers, looking between me and Zoo as if one of us will release him from answering. Zoo, it's fine. I wave her off. I'm sure you can find someone else. Probably be for the best. Enan recovers his voice. His eyes drift to me for a moment before looking away. But yes, I think Zelly would look beautiful. My face heats, growing warmer when Amari studies us. I turned and focused my attention elsewhere, trying to ignore the way Enan's answer makes something inside me tingle. Once again, the way he carried me into the camp forces itself back into my mind. Zoo, what's that? I point to a black cart with a long line of diviners. That's where Falake is painting the clan Bajis. Zoo's eyes light up. You have to get one. Bajis? Amari's nose scrunches in confusion. Zoo gestures to the symbol painted on her neck. She grabs Enan and Amari by the hands and pulls, running ahead. They're lovely. Come on, you have to see it now. Zoo moves fast, leading them farther through the crowd. I consider a brisker pace, but... There's something about walking through this camp that makes me want to slow down. Each time I pass a new diviner, my mind runs wild, imagining all the different types of magi they could become. There could be future winders on my left or seers on my right. With ten clans, there's even a chance a future reaper is right in front of me. A stranger bumps into me. Clad in red and black, he grips my waist, steadying me before I tumble back. Apologies, he smiles. My feet have a nasty habit of following my heart. It's fine. My voice trails off. The stranger looks like no one I've ever seen. No descendant of Arishan blood. His complexion is like sandstone, rich with copper undertones. Unlike the round eyes of Arishans, his are angular and hooded, highlighting his stormy gray eyes. Rowan, he smiles again. It's a delight. I hope you can find the heart to forgive my clumsiness. His accent clips the T's and rolls the R's in his speech. He has to be a merchant, some trader from another land. Finally. I look the young man up and down. Dezane's told me about meeting the occasional foreigner while traveling to Risha for his Agbon matches, but I've never met one myself. Over the years, I've heard descriptions of unique traders in crowded markets and travelers passing through Arisha's busiest cities. I always hoped one would come to Aloran, but... They never make it all the way to our eastern coast. Questions fill my mind, but then I realize his hand is still on the small of my back. My cheeks warm as I slide away from his touch. I shouldn't stare, but from the smirk on Rowan's lips, I can almost guarantee he likes it. Till we meet again, he winks and struts off, holding my gaze. But before he can take another step, Enan reappears and grabs his arm. The smile fades from Rowan's eyes as he glances at Enan's grip. I don't know your intention, brother, but that's a good way to lose a hand. So is pickpocketing. Enan sets his jaw. Give it back. The gray-eyed stranger glances at me. With a sheepish shrug, he removes a compacted staff from the pocket of his draped pants. My eyes widen as I reach for my empty waistband. How the hell did you do that? I swipe back the staff. Mama Agba's trained us to feel a thief's touch. I should have sensed his hand. First bump. Then why'd you linger? I ask. If you're that smooth, you could have gotten away. I couldn't resist. Rowan grins like a foxer, revealing teeth that shine a little too bright. From behind, I only saw the beautiful staff. I didn't know it'd be on a beautiful girl. I glare at him, but it only makes his smile wider. As I said before, love, 
he gives a little bow till we meet again. With that, he saunters off, walking over to Kwame in the distance. They grasp each other's fists in a familiar greeting, exchanging words I can't hear. Kwame eyes me for a second before the two disappear into a tent. I can't help but wonder what Kwame would be doing meeting with a man like that. Thanks, I say to Enan as I run my fingers over the carved staff markings. It's the only thing I have left from Aloran, the only tie to the life I once had. I think back to Mama Agba, wishing I could see her and Baba again. If I knew all it took to distract you was a charming smile, I would have tried that ages ago. It wasn't his smile. I lift my chin. I've never seen someone from another land. Ah, was that all it was? Enan grins, subtle yet completely disarming. In our time together, I've seen everything from rage to pain play across his lips, but never anything close to an actual smile. Creates a dimple in his cheek, crinkling the skin around his amber eyes. What is it? He asks. Nothing. I turn back to my staff. Between the captain and the smile, it's hard to believe I'm still looking at the little prince. Ugh! Enan's grin transforms to a wince. He clenches his teeth and grips his side. What's wrong? I put my hand on his back. Do you need me to get Zoo? He shakes his head, exhaling a frustrated breath. This isn't the type of thing she could heal. I tilt my head until I realize the meaning behind his words. He looked so different in a cobalt caftan, I didn't even notice the air around him was cold. You're suppressing your magic. My heart falls in my chest. You don't have to, Ina. No one here knows who you are. It's not that. Ina embraces himself before standing up straight. There are too many people. I have to control it. If I let it out, someone could get hurt. Once again, I get a glimpse of the broken little prince who charged me with his blade. I knew he was scared, but was he really this afraid of himself? I can help you. I drop my hand, at least a little. If you learned how to control it, it wouldn't hurt you like this. Enan pulls at the collar of the caftan, though it hangs loose around his neck. You wouldn't mind? It's fine. I grab his arm, leading him away from the crowds. Come on, I know a place we can go. The Gombe River trickles beside us, filling the air with its song. I thought the new surroundings might calm Enan, but now that we sit, I realize I need calming myself. The nerves that hit when Zoo asked me to lead the Magi return, stronger this time. I don't know how to help Enan. I'm still trying to figure Reaper magic out myself. Talk to me. I take a deep breath and feign the confidence I wish I had. What does your magic feel like? When does it hit you the strongest? Enan swallows, fingers twitching around a phantom object. I don't know. I don't understand anything about it at all. Here. I reach into my pocket and place a bronze piece into his palm. Stop fidgeting. You're making me itch. What's this? Something you can play with without poisoning yourself. Have at it and calm down. Enan smiles again, this time fully, when that reaches and softens his eyes. He runs his thumb over the cheetah air engraved in the coin center, marking it as a Rishan. I don't think I've ever held a bronze piece. Ugh, I choke in disgust. Keep facts like that to yourself, or I won't be able to stomach this. Forgive me. Enan tests the weight of the coin in his palm, and thank you. Thank me by making this work. When was the last time you really let your magic flow? With the bronze piece passing between his fingers, Enan begins to think. That temple. Chendomble? He nods. It amplified my, my abilities when I was trying to find you. I sat under a painting of Ori and, I don't know, it was the first time I felt like there was something I could control. The dreamscape. I think back to, sorry, I think back to the last time we were there, wondering what I must have said. Did I say something, get something away? How does it work? I ask. There are times when it feels like you're reading a book inside my head. More like a puzzle than a book, Enan corrects me. It's not always clear, but when your thoughts and emotions are intense, I feel them too. You get that with everyone? He shakes his head. Not to the same degree. Everyone else feels like being caught in the rain. You're the whole tsunami. I freeze at the power of his words, trying to imagine what that would be like. The fear, the pain, the memories of Mama being ripped away. It's 
sounds awful, I whisper. Not always. He stares at me like he can't see straight into my heart, straight into everything I am. There are times when it's amazing, beautiful even. My heart swells in my chest. A coil of hair falls in front of my face and Enan tucks it behind my ear. Goosebumps prickle down my neck when his fingers brush my skin. I clear my throat and look away. Ignoring the thumping inside my head, I don't know what's going on, but I know I can't allow myself to feel like this. Your magic is strong. I push the focus back. Believe it or not, it comes naturally to you. You channel things instinctively that most magi would need a powerful incantation to do. How can I control it? Enan asks. What do I do? Close your eyes, I instruct. Repeat after me. I don't know connector incantations, but I do know how to ask for help from the gods. Enan closes his eyes and grips the bronze piece tight. It's simple. Sorry about that. That scared me. Ori ba mi soro. Ba mi soro? Ba mi soro. I correct his pronunciation with a smile. It's endearing how clumsy Yoruba sounds on his lips. Repeat it. Picture Ori. Open yourself up and ask for his help. It's what being a magi is about. With the gods on your side, you're never truly alone. Enan looks down. They're really always there? Always. I think back to all those years I turned my back on them. Even in the darkest times, the gods are always there. Whether we acknowledge them or not, they always have a plan. Aiden's hand closes over the bronze piece, face turning pensive. All righty, nods, I want to try. He chants under his breath, fingers twisting around the bronze piece. At first, nothing happens, but as he continues, the air begins to heat. A soft blue glow appears in his hands. The light creeps its way over to me. I close my eyes as the world spins away. A hot rush, just like the other day. When the spinning ends, I'm back in the dreamscape. But this time, when the reeds tickle my feet, I don't have to feel afraid. Okay, so just into chapter 53. So take a moment, summarize that. And once you're done with your notes on that chapter, then continue on to chapter 54.